Welcome back to uh, chapter four. As we're looking at our church history uh, class, we're doing a walkthrough of uh, the entire 2,000 year history of the church here in, in 15 weeks. We're on chapter four, and today we're looking at the conversion of Europe. You might recall we've been looking at, you know, there was the, the apostles and the disciples were there. At the, the early church was founded in Jerusalem, but are, they are uh, pretty quickly run out of Jerusalem because of the persecution of the same people that tried to kill Jesus, right? And so from there, the apostles and a lot of the other followers of Christ, but particularly the apostles, spread out all throughout the Roman Empire, right? Northern Africa, all through Italy, uh, even Eastern and, and, and Western uh, parts of the empire as well, all kind of around the Mediterranean Sea for the most part, which is where the kind of the Roman Empire had spread. Okay, and so now we're going to look at how it even spreads further than that, how it spreads beyond now the Roman Empire. And as we'll see, there are good reasons for why it spreads there. I want to just say here briefly at the beginning, your book does a really nice job of listing these really important and saintly people that we typically call the church fathers. Now, this is not the whole list of them. But when we talk about the church fathers, I'll tell you one of the biggest things that changed my life and really made me begin to appreciate Catholicism was when I went and read a really short book of, of the different church fathers. And they really weren't, you know, each of these people here has written books, you know, and books and books. And so this collection, if you go look for just a short little collections of the church fathers, they'll just give you a taste of their, of their most central writings. And so I had a book that was like about that thin, you know, it was just super thin on the Church Fathers, but it talked about, it had excerpts from St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil and St. Gregory of Nyssa and some of these guys, St. Augustine, right, who, again, has written an entire library. But find a little excerpt book of the Church Fathers and just read through their stuff. It's really amazing how Catholic it is, right, how central what these guys were saying 1,700, 1,800 years ago is right in line with so much of what we believe today, right? In line with everything that we believe today. So I just want to say their names, just in case you hear them, you've, you, you can say, hey, I heard that name somewhere. St. Ambrose was a bishop in Milan, Italy from the 339. That was when he was born. He died in 397. Uh, he wrote a book called Our Moral Life in Christ, which is just a, a really power-packed teaching. Here it, already just in the 300s, this really laid out program of what it means to do right, to do wrong, and how to grow in virtue in the church. St. Ambrose actually baptizes and brings into the church, Saint Aug helps bring in St. Augustine, who's at the bottom, who was also uh, in 354 to 430. He, was, he ends up living this crazy life early on in his life, but converts to and returns to his Catholic roots. He then, as a, as a Catholic, is a follower of the Manichaean her heresy that we talked about last week. Uh, but then he begins, uh, he converts and, and, and returns to the authentic truth of the church, the Catholic church, becomes the Bishop of Hippo, uh, which is in northern Africa, and there fights another heresy, the Donatists. Okay? We have St. Gregory of Nyssa, 330 to 395. His brother is St. Basil the Great, 330 to 379, two very powerful, power-packed, I like to say, saints who, who just had so much uh, great things to teach and say and spread the faith. St. John Chrysostom, 347 to 407, he was, he's the best preacher in the history of the Catholic Church, uh, pretty much by all accounts. His, a lot of his writings continue on. His homilies are they were written 1,700 years ago, but they're just as good today uh, and as powerful and as poignant and relevant as, as they were 1,700 years ago. St. Jerome, 345 to 420, he has a huge role in translating the Bible into Latin so that it could be read by uh, people throughout the, the church as it spreads throughout the Roman Empire and then into Europe. Okay? So we have these, this is just a small sample of these people who play these pivotal roles as church fathers in terms of helping spread the church and teach the faith to others. All right, this is going to be one of the, we're going to look today here at uh, one of the reasons that the church spreads beyond the Roman Empire. Okay, now this is a kind of a confusing map. There's a lot of arrows and a lot of colors going on here, right? But here is the Roman Empire, essentially here hovering uh, around the Mediterranean Sea. You see it here in this sort of this dark brown or, or light brown over here. 
Um, so it's, it's kind of this circle, circling the Mediterranean Sea is the Roman Empire. Now, we're going to look at this in just a second, why, exactly why this is. But the Roman Empire begins to weaken. And, and really important reasons for why here in just a second. But as it weakens, right, what we also see is then in invasions of what we would call the barbarians, although they aren't barbaric, they were just given that title. But then a lot of times there actually was some culture, right? There, there, it wasn't like they were just, you know, knuckle dragging, um, unsophisticated people. Really, the ones that had be kind of. Rome kind of, the Roman Empire and the people within the empire in many ways were the ones that lost their way and lost their sense of culture and truth and began to just kind of wallow, their, their lifestyle caught up with them and they began to be weak. So the, the, those from other areas, you know, sense that and invade and, you know, begin to wage war. But it isn't just this outright war. There's a lot of, you know, uh, so you have the... Um, you, the, for example, you have the Saxons and the Angles and the, the Jews here coming over into England and, and part of the Roman Empire up there. And you have the Huns and you have the Vandals and the Visigoths and the Goths coming into all these different... The Huns, Attila the Hun, right, uh, comes into the Roman Empire and begins to evade. But then the, the, it isn't just... An, again, it's not just an outright war and it's not like, you know, just one year. It happens over time and there's a lot of exchange going on, and sometimes the barbarians would join the Roman Empire and all that kind of stuff. So it's this long process, though, but that's one of the things, and eventually the Roman Empire collapses, and as these people are entering, and these, these barbaric, in quotes, these barbarian tribes and so forth, begin to sort of break down the Roman Empire, there's now an avenue for which the gospel and the culture can spread beyond the Roman Empire in, as these other communities are coming in and are encountering the Roman Empire and also then are encountering the gospel and are encountering the church, right? These, this opens up this new field for people hearing about the gospel beyond people needing to leave Rome, okay? So there's this kind of, if you think of it as almost like rivers opening up out into the wider world of Europe and beyond because the fall of the Roman Empire encourages people to spread out a little bit, one of the reasons. But then also, as you have these barbarian tribes and cultures coming in, it's now necessarily then, the culture of Rome and the church is necessarily also kind of flowing back in that other direction as well. So this is one of the reasons that, that the church then spreads, and then we're going to get into that here in a minute. I think it's really important, though, this is a really important and, and a great quote that I was sent uh, from my brother uh, several years ago. He was reading this in a class, and he sent it to me, and I think it's just super important as we think about the fall of Rome, right? Again, a lot of times it's told very simplistically that the barbarians just came in and, like, you know, conquered through strength and might. This is actually what, th th this is a quote from a historian in his book, Ancient Rome, and I think it's important because it has a lot of similarities to our own culture today, okay? Here's his quote about Rome. Wealthy people had increasingly come to prefer spending money on luxuries instead of on raising families. They began to prioritize stuff over people, over children. Feeling that the expense and trouble of having children threatened its high standard of living, the elite in the Roman Empire failed to reproduce itself sufficiently. They stopped having kids because they wanted, in many instances, they wanted to maintain and keep their money, and they were worried that kids would cost them money, and kids do cost money, but they began to prioritize money over life. Children became so rare among the social class that Caesar Augustus passed laws designed to strengthen marriages and encourage more births by granting legal privileges to the parents of three or more children. So Caesar begins to have, the Caesar Augustus, one of the Caesars says, if you have more than three children, we will give you benefits, right? Because he recognized we're not having kids, right? Those of us, uh, the Roman Empire, which is really what a, a healthy society is based on. Caesar also makes adultery a criminal offense as another attempt to try to protect marriage. So seriously did he support these reforms that he exiled his own daughter and a granddaughter because of extramarital sexual affairs that she was having. Caesar 
right, recognized Caesar Augustus this, uh, recognized this importance of trying to preserve marriage, preserve and encourage having children because he realized that, that things were falling apart. His legislation had little effect, however, and the prestigious old families withered away under the empire. Demographic or population research suggests that three quarters of the families of the senatorial status, the elite people in the Roman Empire, died out in every generation. People from below that class who won the emperor's favor continuously took their places in the social hierarchy. So essentially what I'm trying to get at is, is that one of the reasons that the Roman Empire collapses is because of the, the attraction of the wealth and moving away from having children which always bolsters and builds up a society from below, brings up the next generation, they began to say, you know what, we're not going to have any kids because we'd rather have money. And that's typically what we see in, in many circles in our own day as well, particularly the more wealthy that we are, the more people today are, are attracted to that mindset, unfortunately. Not all, but of course, it's more likely that people would be that, doing that in our own culture. So I think we need to ask ourselves, as Catholics in the church and outside the church, what is this effect of us not having children? Right? We're not even having enough children to replace our own population. And you can get into, there's a lot of great stuff out there about how our society, too, might be walking towards collapse because once you get a certain point, you get past this point of no return, you don't even have enough people to take care of the previous generation, right? So there's this whole thing. But I, I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on that today, but that's just one of the reasons we want to get into. It wasn't just these mighty barbarians rolling into town. Okay, so as the barbarians roll in, Roman Empire begins to collapse. We see missionaries begin to spread out from the Roman Empire and beyond. And so we have the conversion of the rest of Europe as well. So again, we have the conversion of Ireland, right? And we're going to look at the conversion of Poland. And we're going to look at the conversion of France and Spain, okay? Some of these other places that weren't uh, necessarily completely part of the Roman Empire. All right, Ireland. Let's start with there. St. Patrick, of course. Fascinating story on St. Patrick. He's from England, okay? But he's enslaved in Ireland as a teenager, as a young person. He escapes slavery in Europe and is on a boat back to England, right? And he's told by God to go back to Ireland, where he was a slave, and to convert the country. And of course he does. He does that and is still credited today uh, by, by all as having led the uh, bringing about the conversion of the entire Ir uh, Irish Isle, uh, the island of Ireland. Okay. France, okay, there's an interesting story about how France is converted. And a lot of these are going to involve the rulers of these, of these nations. Okay, so France is, uh, at the time, there's the, the largest part of it, it was the Frankish tribe. Okay, so again, you, we don't see these countries forming necessarily right away. That'll come later. A lot of it's tribes, groups of people, alliances, and that kind of stuff. So this major Frankish tribe, they are surrounded in the year 497 by a much larger force, a much larger army that's seeking to conquer them. The king of the Frankish tribe is a guy named Clovis, and he's told that he should promise to convert to God, to Christianity, if they win this miraculous battle. So he does that. He promises, says God, you know, essentially one of those prayers that we make sometimes, God, if you're out there, if we win this, I will convert. Now, they do. The army, the Frankish tribe, wins this battle in a way that they, you know, against this um, in, in a miraculous way. And literally, the whole army enters the water. The, the whole Frankish tribe there on the spot enters the water, thousands of troops and king, the king himself, and are baptized and convert to Christianity. And so that's where kind of France takes its beginnings as a, a, as a Christian nation, although it's not a nation yet. Okay, England, the English peoples. The English people that, that make up what will again become England uh, the Pope at the time uh, sends a, a, a person by the name of Augustine of Canterbury, and they are and and, and he helps convert a guy by the name of King Ethelbert, um, who then brings about the conversion of the rest of the land. And so we see this attempt, I think, a lot of times to reach the leaders, which is only natural, reach the leaders of these places, these tribes, these countries, these groups, to get them to convert, convince them, so that they can then convince their people about Christianity and about the truths of things. And we look at Germany. 
There is, uh, it was converted largely by St. Boniface. There was this oak, this oak tree that everybody, uh, a lot of the, the, the tribes that were making up Germany at the time, um, that they, they called it the Oak of Thor, right, of, of the god Thor. And um, St. Boniface, everyone said, you know, if you cut that down, you will die. Thor will kill you. He will smote you. You have no shot. So St. Boniface cuts it down. Nothing happens to him. So everyone is shocked. And then he actually goes on to build a, a, a temple, a, a church or a chapel to St. Peter's, just consecrated to St. Peter with the tree, with the, uh, the wood from that oak. And so that begins the conversion of many of the German peoples when they realize Thor, this god that they had believed was real, wasn't actually real. And, and, um, and, and so St. Boniface is credited and has a great devotion in Germany. The Polish people were converted largely by two, uh, two saints, Saints Cyril and, Meth Cyril and Methodius. Um, St. Cyril invents what we, uh, in many ways, consider to be the, uh, 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 the, al the he, he helped invent an alphabet that would then help, so they used that to help teach people to read, and then he was able to use that education that he was able to provide to help them understand, read the, read the Bible, all, but also just learn and grow in intellectual. So, St. Cyril and Methodius really bring not only the gospel, but they bring education in a lot of ways to the people, and through that education, then they're able to bring them the good news of the gospel. So we see, you know, again, we, we have this ancient and long tradition in our Catholic Church of also prioritizing wisdom and teaching people, right? And, and recognizing, look, if we help people become smarter and use their minds, uh, then that will always bring them closer to God if, it's, if those gifts are used rightly. The conversion of Russia, again, largely involves, first and foremost, a conversion of a king. There was a king by the name of Vladimir, and he actually um, offers, he it was kind of a, uh, you know, he kind of lived a, a wild lifestyle, a kingly lifestyle. He had like five wives and all this kind of stuff. And he, he offers to be baptized in order to acquire the king of Constantinople in order to get his, this king's sister. Vladimir says, look, if you give me your sister... I will be baptized and, and convert to your faith, right? So um, it actually happens. He, he is baptized. But the crazy thing is, is that Vladimir then experiences this radical conversion that takes place in his life as a part of this baptism. So then he begins to live out Christianity. He dismisses his other five wives, right? And he began, begins to throw like these huge banquets for the poor and all this stuff. So we see this guy that... that kind of baptized in order, you know, offered baptism in a very, you know, for a very sinful reason. But as he's baptized, that just brings about this, this spark and this change and conversion in his heart. Okay, so pretty cool story how Russia kind of begins to be converted um, as well. One of the really important things in this area of, of history, as we look at, you know, the 300s to about the seven or 800s today, is we, it, 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 we need to mention here the importance that monasticism plays in the early church, in this period of church history. Okay, monasticism, or where we get the word monks from, okay? Mono, of monasticism, mono means alone, or, you know, one, by yourself. And so there's this idea of doing it alone, of, of, of being a part of a community, but also kind of going off to be alone in some ways with God versus being maybe more of the world. All right, the, the, the father of monasticism is a guy by the name of St. Benedict, okay? And he establishes a monastery at a place in Italy called Monte Cassino in 529 AD, right? So that's really kind of considered to be the first monastic presence in, in uh, the, the, the church, all right? He founds about 12 or 13 more monasteries in his life, and they from, from there, monasticism explodes all over Europe. People are really drawn to this. Because if you think about it, Christianity is pretty hard to live in just a general population when you're not surrounded by lots of other people who are living it. And particularly as it spreads, there's so many places where, again, the culture just was not Christian. People might even be, con might even be converting but you wouldn't say that the culture was Christian yet, right? It took, takes a long time to change a culture from, from the inside. And so I think a lot of times monasticism really was popular 
because people said, wait, I can go join and live this gospel that I'm being called to follow, that I, that I recognize to be true. I can go live it with a bunch of people in a separate place, in a, you know, in a, in a building that is li they're living very simply, and they are radically committed to living this. So, mon monasteries are always built, you know, off to the side or, or typically, you know, like kind of out in the country or, you know, away from a bit the towns. Not, not always, but, you know, it's this idea that, gosh, we're going to get away and we're going to live this together. We're both, we're all committed, all of us, you know, whoever's in this monastery are going to be radically committed to this. So it had huge appeal to people and really, I think, explains why it spreads so quickly. Um, but maybe not as, as, as it's obviously not exploding in our own day. There's still tons of monasteries. But I think you and I have an easier time living our Catholic faith without having to join a monastery, right? But I think to me it makes a lot of sense why this spread so quickly. Um, Benedict writes what is called the Rule of Benedict, a, a kind of a constitution for monasteries. And again, that's used in a lot of other monasteries and as it spreads around the world. Uh, he based his system on ora et labora, which is Latin for uh, prayer and work. And that was their, the, so they focused in on, we're going to pray a lot, but then we're also going to devote ourselves to manual labor. So we're not going to just be, you know, uh, people who aren't working. We're going to continue to work, but we're going to also be people devoted to prayer. Um, okay, so that's monasticism. As we look at the Dark Ages, so this is kind of, so monasticism starts to spread. Many people will say, you know, look, ever since the Roman Empire actually fell, when, when, when the Roman Empire falls, you know, there's this dark time because now there's no culture, right? That's, what, that's, that's why we always talk about the barbarians as being uncultured, as if they, you know, they didn't have any music or anything. They were just brute, grunt people, which is totally false, right? It's totally not true. Um, yes, there was a lot of great culture in Rome, right? In high, very high culture in Greece, a lot of great culture in Athens as well, right? But these other people have cultures too. And so to pretend that, well, gosh, when Rome falls, there was no more culture. And so we entered this, the dark ages, right? And suddenly people stopped like what? You know, like singing and getting together and doing plays and all these other things that we think of when we think of culture, you know, and there was, that there was no science, that there was, no, you know, that just suddenly everything stopped because Rome fell because they stopped having kids, right? And the barbarians showed up. No, that's not it at all. And, and so, but we see that that would be a really helpful narrative for people. And some people spread that lie really about, you know, oh my gosh, when Rome fell, everything died, you know, and then it took, you know, okay. This is really important because okay? sometimes Catholicism is even blamed for the dark ages, right? Um, and as, if, as if because, well, because we, we, we brought faith to the, the world of Europe and it just made everything awful, right? That's the narrative that people say. And I think it's just super important that we talk about that and confront that because it's just not true. There was a guy who converted to Catholicism, G.K. Chesterton, right? He says this, the idea that Christianity belongs to the Dark Ages. He says, here I didn't satisfy myself with reading modern generalizations, which is what a lot of your high school textbooks are. They're just going to try to zoom through this, right, in, in like a page. The Dark Ages is like 400 years of, of history, right? He's saying, look, I didn't settle for this sort of comic book version of history that people were shoving down our throats. He said this, I actually read a little history, which is always a great idea. The more I read history... The more I love my Catholic faith, the more you see Catholicism, its power, its beauty. You see its sins, the sins of its people at times. But you see, as, as, as Cardinal Newman, who converts to Catholicism, says, the more you read history, the more you cease to become Protestant, the more you become a Catholic, right? So Chesterton says the same thing. He says, look, look I, I didn't listen to the comic books. I actually read a little history. And he said, as I did that, I found that Christianity, far from belonging to the Dark Ages, was the one path across the Dark Ages that was not dark. He said, the most absurd thing that could be said of the church is that we have all heard said of it. He said, how can we say that the church wishes to bring us back to the Dark Ages? The church was the only thing that bre ever brought us out of them. <laughs> right? It's the only thing that ever brought us out of the Dark Ages. Yes, there was a collapse of some of the governmental structures that came with the Roman Empire when it fell. But the church stepped in and was able to provide a lot of that governing structure, that cohesiveness, the stuff that brings all these different areas and cultures and languages. What was able to bring this all together when Rome falls? The Catholic Church, right? Common worship, common prayer, 
common governance, common everything, right? A common culture that's then able to, to, to be the glue that brings North Africa, Russia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. It, it's the glue. Catholicism isn't the reason that there, was, that there were struggles at times in the midst of all of this. Catholicism was what healed all of these things, right, that we typically call, that people call the Dark Ages. And so I just want to, I, I know you're getting bombarded with this garbage in high school, right, and a lot of your history classes a lot of times. And so I just want to tell, talk about that for, for a second. This is another quote. This is the last one I'll share with you from about the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Slightly different things, but you get the point. Okay. This is from a historian, a Catholic historian, Regine Peraud. She talks, her book's called Those Terrible Middle Ages, and she has it in quotes, which is great, because it's kind of sarcastic in the title. She says this, The Middle Ages furnishes a choice field to all those for whom history is only a pretext, a period about which the public at large is ignorant. They are, right? Our public is largely ignorant about it. With a few recognizable names. So they'll say, okay, I heard about Charlemagne, I heard about Joan of Arc, and there's the Inquisition, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the serfs, you know, all working in the mud. She says, that is very much the average stock of knowledge delivered by textbooks for elementary education. It is so easy, in fact, to manipulate history for a public that is not knowledgeable about it. So when we, as the larger public, don't know history, then somebody can come along and say and tell you anything that they want about history. And so particularly, she says, the Middle Ages is privileged material because one can say whatever one wants about it with this quasi-certitude of never being contradicted. So if you are a historian, you can, come up, you can come and say something that you want about the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages or whatever you want to call it, and be basically sure that no one else is going to contradict you, that no one else is going to say, wait, I don't know, that, that, that's not true. If somebody wanted to say something false about the United States, about World War I or World War II or the Civil War, you and I would probably be able to say, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. But when you talk about the Middle Ages, we don't know much about it because we've all learned from some kind of, you know, really watered-down textbook. And so when someone else comes along and says, oh, the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church caused the Dark Ages, blah, 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 when we're like, oh, that must be true because we don't know the history. So that's why we take these classes, which are helping us understand the true history and can help us answer back to those, those, those critiques. Okay, so hopefully that helps a little bit with the Dark Ages and all that stuff that you probably hear every now and then in school and that kind of stuff. All right, we're wrapping up here. We got some bigger chapters in this section than we, than we have had in previous uh, books that we've worked our way through because there's so much history to get through in our classes, but it's awesome because I love this, this, these topics. So thanks for hanging in there. I know this will help you a lot in your faith, I promise. All right, we want to look at Islam, which also springs up about the same time, kind of on the outskirts, right? Kind of on the outskirts of, of what we were talking about with Western and Eastern Europe. Um, and and, and uh, the Roman Empire there. So we have um, a guy named Muhammad who was born near Mecca, which is a part, uh, a city in Arabia. And he's born about 570 AD. So kind of in the midst of this Roman Empire kind of starting to fall in on itself, the church and the missionaries going out. Okay. We also have this rise of Islam. All right. Muhammad founds a religion. Okay, called Islam, based on visions that he claims to have had in a cave from the archangel Gabriel. He says the archangel Gabriel came to him, gave him these visions and these teachings that he was to write down. And so he founds this religion based on that called, um, and Islam translates, it means submission. So in Islam, there's a, there's a, a, a much more, um, I would say, kind of a black and white mentality to it all, that has always been there from the very beginning in the sense that you follow it. You follow the rules, it's there, word for word, right? The, his followers write what is called the Quran, which is, again, the writing down of the visions that um, Muhammad has in that cave uh, from, from what he claims to be the Archangel Gabriel. In there, we see, in the Quran, we see the word jihad, which is encouraged. Now, jihad means holy war. It's first of all mentioned in the Quran when we talk about holy war. 
it, it's, it's being referred to as within oneself. I need to go and have, I need to have a holy war within myself. And that, that's obviously very much in line with Christianity, right? We have this, we have this struggle that's going on inside us and, and, and it could be thought of as a war. Now, the Quran also, though, mentions jihad or holy war as a way to convert unbelievers, right? So there, is, there has been, right from the beginning, there has been a sort of a militaristic notion. When we talk about how Christianity spreads, it is not through military might. It is through going and preaching and convincing people. Um, again, I'm not saying that Christianity is, is perfect. We will talk about some of its imperfections as we continue. And, and at times, there is military might that eventually gets to be involved in it. But certainly as it spreads, it's not that way uh, in the early stages. In Islam, we do see, right from the start, we see this, uh, this pushing out into and so, in, in fact, we could even probably say Islam kind of sweeps across the Christian world in the uh, 600s into the early 700s. Okay, so Muhammad tells his friends in 612 about his vision, 612 AD. Right by 638, they conquer Jerusalem, right, the holy city, the the the, the holy of holies for the cities uh, of Christendom, right, where where Jesus has died and, and uh, or is is crucified and is buried, and the resurrection, and all that kind of stuff, right? It's the Holy Land. It's the Holy City. So only, um, if you do the math there, that's like 26 years after Muhammad first tells his friends that he's had this vision, already Islam is large enough and, and, and is powerful enough to go and conquer Jerusalem 26 years after Muhammad first shares his vision. Only 60 years later, most of North Africa is, is, is Islamic, or we would say is Muslim. Okay, the Muslim world. In 711, okay, again, just 99 years after Muhammad first starts this religion, Spain is conquered by the Islamic, uh, by, by Islamic forces as well. Okay? So we see then in the midst of this, and we'll talk more about this later, but the Crusades really then are a call from the church and from, from, from Christianity to fight back and to push back against the invasion that is happening, right? The conquering that is taking place. It was not Christianity that went to fight Islam. Islam came to fight Christianity and conquer lands and territories. So the Crusades were then, we must go help our friends and take back the territory that was taken from us. And so, as so often, those kinds of disputes take place. But it's very clear where, where it started, right? And I think we're, we, we're not trying to rewrite history there. We can honestly admit and recognize, hopefully, that, that Islam rises, spreads very quickly, and then the church kind of, Christianity has this, the, the people of the church rise up and begin to push back against that because they realize if they didn't, they were going to be completely wiped out. So, uh, again, we're not going to try to defend everything that happens in the Crusades. Uh, and so on and so forth. We'll get into that in, in future chapters. But it's important to know where the Crusades came from, right? And they, they were a response to, the, to that. Okay, so we're finally at our questions today. Again, thanks for sticking in there with us. Um, first of all, the first question, what is monasticism? Okay, how would you define uh, monasticism? Number two, who led the evangelization of Ireland? Who led the evangelization of Ireland? Number three, what area did... St. Boniface help convert. Okay, what area did St. Boniface help convert? Number four, who was the founder of monasticism? Number five, who is the founder of Islam? And then number six, what is the book that Muslims used that was believed to be the visions that Muhammad had? What was the name of the book that they used? Okay, so that's, our, that's all of our uh, questions and all of our presentation for today. I hope and pray that you have a great week and let me know if I can ever help with anything. Take care and God bless.